Hi, this is Jessica Turos from Bowling Green State University Office of Academic Assessment. I'm welcoming you to the Student Affairs Assessment Leaders uh, Structured Conversation on Engaging Students in the Assessment Process. Um, I have Renee as our fabulous technical coordinator. Renee, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Renee Delgado Riley. I'm the Director of Student Life Assessment and Research at the University of Oregon, and I will be um, doing the tech on the background. If you want to go to the next slide, so through this structured conversation, um, we really want it to be an active, engaged participation. So you'll notice there's a chat feature, and Renee has posted the chat instructions where you can create a channel so you can participate. So be sure to do that. And then as questions come up, we'll address those. And then we'll be sure throughout the session, um, you'll be able to hear all the different sort of strategies for engaging students in the assessment process. We'll review benefits of involving students in the assessment process. And then there'll be a plan for engaging students in the assessment process that you'll see that have been implemented at a variety of institutions and you can adapt and make that your own. On the next slide, we'll see here today's presenters. Um, we have Dr. Matthew Cooney, who is an assistant professor at Governor State University. We also have Dr. Kristen McKinney, who is the director of the UCLA Student Affairs Information Research Office. In the next slide, what we'll see is the overview of today's session. So this will be our presentation flow. So um, we'll have Kristen is going to talk about kind of the why and how to involve students. Matt will also touch upon this. Um, Kristen's going to give some great examples, followed by Matt's, and then we'll have wrap-up in questions. And again, throughout the session, feel free at any time to add chat uh, comments in the chat feature, and we'll address those. I'm going to turn it over to Kristen now. Hi, everybody. Um, so I want to jump in and um, just start with this why question. Um, you know, why should we want to engage students in assessment? What's what's the point? What do we get out of it? What do they get out of it? And so um, for us at UCLA, um, this started really with our conversations about um, the value of attending a research university and um, that we tell students that they'll have exposure to research opportunities and um, you know, but on our campus, our data would suggest that a substantial number of our students don't actually take advantage of that opportunity um, to engage in research experiences before they graduate. And so we were really thinking about how could we contribute to that within our office um, in terms of making um, experiences available to the students. Um, on the flip side, we also benefit um, from having students' perspectives um, in, involved in our research that um, the student perspective on studying the student experience, that they um, there's a trust um, that can be generated among um, students who are equals that don't have um, the kind of power dynamics that are potentially present in other kinds of um, situations between staff and students or faculty and students. Um, and they really can frame uh, both research questions and interpretation from their lens and the kinds of things that they're experiencing. And that that really adds value to, um, to findings in terms of what we're able to learn um, when we engage students in that way. Um, you know, at a, at a really basic level, it is a high impact practice. Um, it's good for the students. It's good for us. Um, and, that, you know, those are some of the, the reasons to do it. One thing I will say is that um, it does not significantly reduce workload. So I would not um, suggest thinking about engaging students in assessment as just a way to, um, you know, get labor or that kind of, you know, that um, generally there is a pretty significant training component um, and scaffolding that has to happen. And so um, while the nature of what you spend your time on potentially shifts, that it's um, it's not necessarily a major reduction in the, um, the amount of work that you um, as an individual or as an office are necessarily putting into um, the kinds of things that you would be doing in a research or assessment situation. So, um, just want to give a kind of an example here of this kind of student voice and perspective and, and um, what I have found to be one of the powerful examples from one of this what from one of the early studies that we did in our project um, that was a, um, a study looking at the experience of exclusion on campus um, and it was a photo voice study and so this is one of the photos from that um, 
experience that one of the students took. And um, for those of you not familiar with the UCLA campus, this is Jan Steps. This is, um, you know, like this kind of image is used very regularly in our kind of promotional materials. It's very much a like kind of onward and upward in your education. It's a very, um, you know, meant to be kind of an uplift, uplifting kind of view of um, education. And, and the student um, you will see in the lower right hand corner of the photo, um, his wheelchair there put up on the pedestal of um, at the bottom of Jan Steps. And then what he really talked about in this um, that while for most students, this is a very powerful sort of uplifting image to him, it represents um, the ways in which he is navigating campus is difficult for him, um, that he, for most students walking up these stairs takes less than a minute, whereas for him to get from that lower point on campus to the upper point on campus in his wheelchair means going back and forth on a number of pathways, often um, accessing ramps that are on the back of buildings and you know, next to dumpsters, and how um, this lack of accessibility of the campus really led to his feeling um, you know, a sense of exclusion from the campus and, and the difficulty of navigating. And I think, you know, we, you know, the power of this picture and engaging um, the student really in the representation of um, experiences is something we wouldn't have necessarily gotten from just say a survey, open-ended survey response or something like that. And so really bringing, um, you know, this, the full student voice to bear, I think is a really um, important piece of why we would think about engaging students in assessment. So moving along, I wanna talk about just, you know, uh, you don't have to go all in when thinking about like you don't necessarily have to think about a pro I mean some of the programs you're going to hear about from us later do involve students in the sort of assessment cycle or and research cycle from start to finish but that's not necessarily necessary you can just dip your toe in and so um, I really want to think about like you know thinking about the different opportunity points for involving students at different points in this um, in this cycle and so you know if you just wanted to try something out and see how it goes there are multiple opportunities um, as i'm going to go through each of these points in the cycle um, and talk about some examples that that we've come up with but also um, i encourage folks to if you want to um, give examples in the chat of ways you've involved students in these different points in the cycle in terms, you know, like I think that will really help round out um, what folks on the webinar are able to see in terms of the kinds of things that are happening on our campuses and, and you know, um, really allow us to learn from you as well. So feel free to chat that and um, maybe we'll be able to summarize that towards the end in terms of the kinds of things that are happening. So looking at the planning stage of um, of the assessment cycle um, on the next slide. There we go. Uh, so some examples of the ways you might want to think about including students in planning, um, things like input on the approach you're taking in marketing, um, you know, like the taglines, that kind of thing. We, we did a focus group, for example, on where we got students to talk about what their preferred incentives were. Um, and what some compelling taglines might be for a survey that we were doing, the things that would um, most influence them to want to learn more, to participate, um, even potentially having students design that marketing and outreach, um, helping with recruitment. Um, and I think a sort of underappreciated and underutilized um, opportunity for engaging students is actually in pilot testing instruments, either just, you know, in, um, kind of having them read through or like and doing an execution, but also even something like a cognitive interviewing process for survey questions where you're saying, okay, as you're looking at these survey questions, what are you thinking? How are you interpreting them? Um, could be a really great way of refining and ensuring that the things that you're asking are actually signaling to the students the things that you want to know. So just some definite um, powerful ways to engage students in that planning phase of an assessment. So. In the data collection phase, I would say um, engaging students in data collection generally does involve training um, if they're going to be actively doing data collection. Um, that said, though, there may be opportunities here to partner with others on campus, um, like faculty who have research courses, who maybe are looking for uh, the students to have an opportunity to practice that um, methodology in, um, you know, hands-on. Um, and so there may be some ways to 
um, have the students be getting that training in a way that you don't have to support. Um, so thinking about that, but they can be facilitators or observers of things like fake focus groups or interviews. Um, having them actually be on the ground, asking people to fill out surveys, or just generally um, thinking about, you know, do they have connections to student groups? Can they make course announcements in terms of getting the word out about um, a study that you might be doing, encouraging people to participate in a survey, um, those kinds of things that are important for data collection, but aren't necessarily the um, nitty gritty of actually collecting the data. So. Uh, at the analysis level, um, some ways that you can think about engaging students, obviously, um, doing coding, doing statistical analysis. Again, those kinds of um, activities definitely are going to require some training. Um, you know, but again, thinking about are there faculty that can be partnered with? Um, here at UCLA, we actually, um, the st students in statistics have to do a capstone experience where they have to um, be uh, statistical consultants for a project and so we've had some success with with pairing those students um, in statistics with other departments on campus that maybe have large data sets that they would like to have analyzed and that the students can use as their their project um, so something like that then something requires maybe a little less uh, training but it I think really capitalizes on um, the real the value added of students perspective is engaging them in the interpretive piece so providing them with say some output or results and having them do the interpretation and write up um, really capitalizes on um, their the value that they bring in terms of um, the student perspective so that's another way in analysis to engage them and then finally reporting um, you know basic things, writing up reports, delivering presentations, that kind of stuff. I, I see two major benefits for engaging students at the reporting level. Um, one of which is that students may be able to talk about results and advocate for something in a way that we as representatives of the institution have to dial back from. Um, they can potentially advocate in a more significant way for changes that they wanna see happen um, in our environment than we can. Um, and so uh, that, that is something to think about. And, and their voices in doing that, I think, sometimes are more compelling than our own as, um, you know, because it's like they can sort of speak from a place of these are the things that are happening in my world rather than um, sort of one, one step removed. And then uh, students often have more facility, I would say, I mean, as much as I consider myself a tech savvy kind of a person, they often have a lot more facility with some of our more non-traditional reporting options in terms of using social media or other ways that we might wanna get result, um, results out there. And so that's another uh, opportunity point for potentially engaging them and discussing how do we get these results out? Where are students in, in terms of do, communicating information back to students in reporting, they have much more of a sense of where is that gonna happen and what might be successful in those ways. So um, lots of opportunity points to think about. I'm gonna really um, quickly kind of go through for you um, the primary model that we use in, in our office in, um, in CSIRO, the Student Affairs Information and Research Office, for um, engaging students in our research and assessment work and kind of talk about some of the major elements of that um, for you. So, um, so we call it the Undergraduate Research Partnership Initiative. It is uh, applied research for short, short sort of research assessment um, internship. Uh, where we generally take, uh, right now it's about five or six students per year. Um, we definitely come at this from a philosophy that students need to have no um, experience prior to this. That's um, really important to, to us that we wanted to make this available to students who um, maybe wouldn't necessarily access research experiences and, and make it very inclusive. And so we you know, make it very clear that we will train students on the things that they will need to know. Um, and so there's a real balance for us between um, training and then execution of work. Um, and there are um, team meetings that the students participate um, and a lot of back and forth communication between the students and um, the both. So the, the staff members in, in our office that are um, that are overseeing the project. Um, and at a base level, all of the topics are those that are of interest to student affairs in the sense that this is information that will then inform the campus and um, potentially drive drive changes. So in terms of the general structure of how we um, 
onboard the students and take them through what they're doing. Um, it's generally over the course of a year. We have in certain um, times included some stuff in the late summer in terms of onboarding to just, um, you know, to get them more ready to do certain things in the fall. Um, but in general, we sort of, particularly because when we started this, we, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this, we started it as a, um, as an experience that the students got, uh, course credit for. And so we, we did sort of structure it in a, um, at UCLA, we are in a quarter system. So we structured in three kind of major, um, components. And so we still loosely follow this, um, this guideline, um, in terms of, the, the structure. And so we spent a lot of time um, in the beginning working with them on helping them understand um, both getting their input on study design and um, thinking about what it looks like and making sure they are comfortable with it, with the execution of whatever methodology they're being asked to use. Then we jump into data collection, um, you know, and, and then preparation, for example, transcription, and different kinds of things that might have to happen. Um, and then in the spring round out with, uh, you know, sort of finishing out an analysis and doing some reporting. Um, uh, there have been years where the students have used what they've done in their project to um, propose a poster to the undergraduate research conference. We always have them present back to departments or um, larger groups of student affairs professionals about what they're finding so that then that um, information can be integrated into practice. So, um, so that is our general structure. Um, I put this image in here primarily for me as sort of a visual reminder of what I would say was our, our biggest misstep in when we started working with um, students in developing these structures. And, um, and that was our sort of participatory action research ideal versus the reality and that we, um, we were like, oh, we want to bring students in and have them completely design this from their own. You know, we don't want to give them a lot of structure. And um, I wish we had actually had like the graduate student that started our original program with this. And I said, we wish we had had this um, this visual at the beginning, because what we basically did was um, threw people off the diving board in terms of um, our original conception of what we were doing and did not really um, scaffold them into um, this more emancipatory kind of um, pedagogy and curriculum. And so in our first year, we definitely were, had a lot of pushback from the students in terms of what do you want us to do? You need to give us more guidelines where, you know, we're, we don't like this, it's too uncertain, um, because they had just not really had any exposure to the idea that, um, you know, this kind of stuff was happening, right? Like, you know, that um, that they could guide their own knowledge that, um, and so that was really uncomfortable for them. And so um, we in subsequent years have still, and it's a delicate balance, I will say, between um, providing structure and guidance in a, you know, in a way that they want and feel comfortable with, but for us also really pushing them to have some ownership and to bring their knowledge to bear in the situation so that we're really um, capitalizing on because they don't in, so, in many ways don't trust their own knowledge in this situation and and so there's a balance there of really trying to bring that out um, and so that that can add value to um, to the situation so um, I see Jessica sent me a message um, in terms of the kinds of studies that the students have worked on. Um, a lot of our early studies focused on aspects of um, different aspects of climate um, related questions for the campus, things like um, the experiences of LGBTQ students um, on the campus. Uh, we looked at um, international students and their integration to the campus as one of the studies. Um, and one thing that I'm going to I'm actually now rolling into here is um, when we we've made some transitions to the program, one of which one big transition was moving it from a contract course to a paid internship, um, as well as making some changes where um, our projects became more focused um, within individual departments rather than sort of larger, um, you know, uh, like, for example, one of our early studies was kind of um, where and with whom are people talking about um, talking about race, right? Like, where does this, does this happen on campus? Where does it happen? How does it go? Sorts of questions. Um, and that was a very, some of those early projects were really big picture um, versus some of our more recent projects have been more local to a particular department. And I'll talk a little bit in the next slides about um, 
why some of the reasoning why that is. So, um, yeah. So as I mentioned, we started this as a lower division contract course um, with these larger, larger questions. Um, one of the primary reasons why we changed it from a credit-based intern research experience to this more paid assessment internship was because of some particular things that happened on our campus around 0% um, lecturer appointments and, um, and the removing of those appointments so that um, some of us in student affairs could no longer um, be the instructor of record for contract classes. And so that became not an opportunity for, for us anymore. And so we had to come up with a different model. Um, the, and so then we focused more on, on a paid internship. I, I will say my experience has been that um, the students who are getting paid to do this work are actually more committed to getting it done than they were when it was just a pass, no pass class. So um, something to think about in terms of um, how that looks. The other major piece for us was um, to, and, and this was for a number of reasons, both in terms of what we felt was fundable in terms of where the money came from for, for this experience, but also our observations of what was happening with the reporting, um, that when uh, the projects were more focused on something that a particular department felt they had ownership in, they were more likely to use the results to make change than when we had these sort of larger, you know, um, these larger questions that that touched more of the whole campus that we didn't and, and the students really didn't necessarily see there being adoption of the recommendations that they were making. And so, um, but when they like for the LGBTQ study, for example, because our LGBT center had, um, you know, like really was interested in the results and, and actually did make some changes. Um, you know, one of the findings of that was that that students really wanted, um, felt that the center did not focus on intersectional identities in a way that they wanted. And they really, um, the next year came out with some um, some additional programming around, uh, around that. And so seeing that we said, okay, let's focus more on that constrained level. Let's work specifically with a department to identify a question that they are interested in having answered and then working on this in this more consultant way to work with the department what are they interested in design a study related to that share those um, recommendations back to them so that they can really implement changes and and i think that's really like it has allowed for some really better scaffolding of um, how things might happen so really quickly i know i'm i want to make sure that we have time for matt's examples but just what are some of the outcomes of this um, you know, I've mentioned a few outcomes in terms of changes that departments have made as a result of the studies. Um, what are the outcomes for the students? Um, I've chosen three of our um, intended outcomes for URPI. We do have outcomes that we try to assess. So um, in terms of the kinds of things we're hoping that they learn from the experience. So on this first slide, um, I'm not going to read off the quotes, but I've pulled some quotes from some of the um, the evaluations that we've done of the experience. So on this first one here, um, one of our one of our intended outcomes is just basically helping students understand the research process and its foundations. And definitely we see that students, um, and I think here really um, begin to say, okay, I understand the research process. Um, and though it doesn't necessarily come out in this, um, in this quote per se, but but I think we also see really um, they're beginning to see themselves as um, students who for whom this is possible, like that they have a, that they consider themselves researchers, that this is something that there's a sort of research identity that, you know, or like um, that, that, wow, I didn't think this was something that I could do before I did this experience. And now I realize that it is so. Um, in terms, so um, obviously they get um, some methodological training. So there's a lot in their discussion of what they're learning in terms of I now know how, like how to, um, you know, to do these things that are both research specific skills, but also some broadly transferable skills like public speaking and, you know, ability to communicate with others. And so, um, you know, definitely some findings there. And then a final example. Um, you know, one of our outcomes is their ability to draft communications and presentations, for example, um, as well as coming up with recommendations for action. And, um, 
you know, they're, they are definitely being able to do that. And one thing that I think is really powerful in this particular quote is it's not a stated outcome of our process, but this um, being a part of the final report and presentation gave me a bit greater sense of belonging to UCLA. And so um, that is something that we hope for that this provides, you know, in the way of a high impact practice, an opportunity for students to feel connected to the institution and feel like they are making a contribution and develop that kind of agency that they might have um, with respect to the things that they do at the institution. Um, I see Jessica also said, um, what kinds of majors? Um, interestingly enough, we have had across, like across the board, all different kinds of majors. Um, We've had students in STEM majors, um, you know, to, I mean, I would say probably more interest from things like social sciences and education, but we have run the gamut. We've definitely had biology students or, you know, other kinds of, you know, um, engineering math um, that are just maybe interested in the topic or, you know, um, interested in getting more research experience. So, um, definitely from all over. So I'm gonna turn it over to Matt now um, to talk about uh, the work that he's doing with his students. And I see there are some more questions coming up from Jessica and, and hopefully we will address those um, at the end, so. Oops, got so perfect, thank you. So I'm excited to talk about um, some projects that I've been involved with. So uh, my name is Matthew Cooney. So I um, worked in student affairs, research and assessment, and then academic assessment um, at Bowling Green State University um, while finishing my PhD, then transitioned to a faculty role at Governor State University in their higher education program. So um, I've been very fortunate to learn so much along the lines about how to engage undergraduates, um, you know, in both sides, in research and both the assessment side. So the first example that I'd like to talk about is at Bowling Green State University. So um, this is our student learning analysts role. So um, with the student learning analyst, um, if we just want to go back one slide on, um, yeah, perfect. Yes. So with the student learning analyst, um, it was um, a project that started in um, fall 26, sorry, in summer 2016. And it was a uh, collaboration um, with the Office of Academic Assessment and the overall um, Division of Institutional Effectiveness. So um, what it was, was um, it was a paid undergraduate assessment experience. So with this, it's very important to emphasize that it was an assessment experience. And the reason that um, we kind of focus more on the assessment experience is because we did not necessarily need to go through the IRB process. So if you are um, considering going through, um, you know, if you are considering going through and developing a program like this, please keep in mind whether or not you're gonna need to go through IRB process. Because if you do, um, it might delay the project a little bit, which was the experience that we had at Governor State University, which um, we'll talk about next. Um, but for the, the initial pilot program was in 2016, 2017 academic year. Um, and with that, um, the 2016, 2017 academic year um, was designed more or less to see if this was a program that the institution would like to consider um, moving forward with. So it came up, um, the Assistant Vice Provost for Institutional Effectiveness at the time secured funding for the pilot year and then charged the Associate Director of Academic Assessment um, to uh, charge the Associate Director of Academic Assessment and a graduate assistant under that Associate Director to start the program. So that's where Jessica and I worked together originally on the initial year. So um, some of the projects that, um, this pro that this group has done, so. Um, in the past few years included um, projects on student expectations for learning, um, student engagement in the classroom, and those were the initial two in um, fall 2016. And then in spring 2017, um, they focus on the higher order learning and learning strategies, um, reflective integrative learning. And since that time, um, they've had projects focused on academic honesty, capstone experiences, quantitative literacy, diversity and inclusion, uh, innovation in the classroom, student success, and a few other topics. So you could actually see the results from those, the infographics, um, on the Provost website um, at Bowling Green State, uh, at BGSU. So with Governor State University, um, the, this project started um, through the Office of the Provost and the Division of Student Affairs. So the Office of the Provost collaborated with Division of Student Affairs and received funding from the Strata Education Network and the American Association of Colleges and Universities. Um, a call for proposals won out 
um, that highlighted the need for um, high impact practices um, and also looking at equity issues on campus. So I do want to note here that um, this is very this is very much um, something that is great for Governor State University because we're not a research one institution. So whenever we're doing our work, we're really cognizant of focusing on um, you know the campus and the local communities in which we serve. Um, so it was a great opportunity to combine the high impact practice through faculty research um, with examining equity issues on campus. Um, so I received the grant and rather than take the money for supplies, what I did is I signed the money over to all the students to create a paid uh, research opportunity for them that would in turn impact some of the work that we've done on campus. So this was um, a research project in that we did have to go through IRB, but it was very much assessment informed. You know, as we all know, that research assessment divide, you know, sometimes the line is so blurry. And that's a good thing for an undergraduate research project because it allows the students to really think about um, what is the capacity and what is the um, potential change that you can make through the research. So that project looked at um, the experiences of academically high achieving African-American women at GSU. So um, it definitely borrowed from uh, Sean Harper's work talking about um, you know, anti-deficit framework and we applied that to, um, to African-American women at GSU. Um, and this was completely run um, by the students. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but the first lesson I kind of want to um, focus on is the importance of situating the program in the institution. So, um, you know, this, um, um, this program, you know, it was very important to focus on um, trying to make sure that we have executive leadership and support. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how we got that student support and how we got um, the particular students that we were looking for, what majors they came from, and the criteria we were looking for. We'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Um, but for this one, we're talking about with executive leadership. So this was something that was essential in order for the program to be successful. So um, straight from that with Bowling Green State University, uh, coming from the Office of the Pro coming from Institutional Effectiveness, which is under the office of the provost, um, they're very much interested in provided the fundings for this program to go through. Um, at Governor State University, um, developing a research, you know, an undergraduate research experience like this, um, you know, coming directly from the office of the provost and the Division of Student Affairs, which included um, the division, you know, the vice president for student affairs, um, it was really important for our program because um, it let other people know on campus that this wasn't just a group of students that were coming together to looking at issues. It was a structured program, um, you know, that it was a structured program that really focused on, um, you know, a scientific method in the way that we are looking for more information and knowledge. So within um, situating the program in the institution, the most important aspect, I think, was um, making sure that students are at the center of the deliverables. So Kristen highlighted a little bit more about how um, the impact of coming from the impact of the results coming from students really was um, something that we wouldn't necessarily be able to get away with um, as you know faculty and staff members on campus. Well, untenured, yeah, uh, faculty on campus. Um, really important for that. So what we did um, to make sure that students were at the center of the um, process was um, we really want to make sure that the students had program ownership. So um, at Governor State, for example, what we did is um, the general topics on what the research project assessment could look like came from um, you know, this running group that was in charge of that equity grant on campus. So we were able to kind of choose a topic and then much like Kristen um, highlighted, um, we chose the topic and then we let the students decide what research questions that focused on that topic they wanted to pursue. Um, with that, um, the impact of the undergraduate students sharing the results, um, this is something that we really wanted to um, provide as many opportunities as possible at Governor State University. So what we did is um, GSU students presented at the institutional re at Institution Research Day um, and were one of like the highlight keynote sessions. Um, they also presented at the Division of Student Affairs Professional Development Day. Um, and then we also received funding from the Division of Student Affairs to attend the Student Affairs Assessment and Research Conference as well at Ohio State University. So um, that was kind of their culminating experience with it was um, being able to take the research and travel with it. Um, and that was an experience that, um, you know, 
you know, we know the benefits of, you know, research on campus. We know that high impact practice, but it was really helpful for the students to go out and present this information because it's no matter how much I tell them, you know, as a faculty advisor on how great the work is, how important it is, um, hearing it from other people and other campuses is what really made their experience. So on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit more about recruitment. So with recruitment, um, I very much am a proponent of um, trying to make this a paid research, paid research or assessment opportunity. So at Bowling Green State University, there was funding available um, through the Office of the Provost, which was allocated for the pilot year and uh, continued on. So um, the funding was great for that because we were able to post it on our job board, um, you know, like our BGSU uh, Job Connect. Uh, we were posted there so that way we were able to get the information out to a bunch of students it wasn't just those that we had direct contact with it was posted on the job board and it really um, showed that this is an opportunity um, to engage in research and assessment but it's also a job you know which i think that was important because um, it provided a little bit more oomph at times to get students motivated um, at GSU, um, we did not really, we didn't have any funding, um, you know, any hard money funding. All of ours came from grants. Um, so what we did is, so what I did as, um, you know, the faculty member on this project was, is that I just signed over that grant money to the students um, and gave them a stipend rather than a salary. So I gave them a stipend rather than an hourly position. So that is something that you should probably consider is, is this gonna be something that is gonna be an hourly position where you're in the office for 10 hours a week? Or is it something that you wanna make sure, or is it a program that um, you know, is more like a weekly meet, you know, a bi-weekly meeting and then students work on their own? Um, so that is something to kind of think about. Um, and for my, what I believed it was, um, a lot of that was coming from um, how much funding we had. So you'll see that we have a variety of majors and class standing. So this is from the initial year that we did for um, at Bowling Green State University in uh, 2016. So we were really intentional on bringing students with a variety of majors and class standing. So it, this was probably the most fun to watch though, was when the group came together because you could see some of the business students, uh, you know, would come in and immediately talk about like, okay, what's the bottom line? Like, what is, you know, like, what about cost benefit analysis? So they were very much, you know, focus on it from a business mentality, you know, while we had, you know, students that were, um, you know, from education and um, political science, we're oftentimes talking about like more about, okay, so what is the overall picture? What does this mean? Like, what are people's feelings? What are they doing? So it was a really cool experience to see that. And at the same time, by having of students from a bunch of different uh, class standing, um, it was great to see that mentorship come out um, with these, you know, the juniors and the seniors mentoring the sophomores in the first years, not just in the research experience about, but also about getting involved on campus and making most of their college experience. So when we started our onboarding experience, um, we didn't necessarily look for, we didn't have a variety, we didn't have set majors that we were looking in. We really focused on uh, having creativity and inquisitive mind. And we actually had that in the job description, you know, about the importance of uh, creativity. So our role within, our role during this onboarding experience in the first few weeks was helping students connect the dots on their role in research and assessment. So oftentimes students uh, were coming in there, you know, they believe they don't have that research and assessment experience. And we had to help reframe that for them is that yes, you have this research and assessment experience. It just may not be in this formalized process, but we all have that ability to think about a problem and then go through and try to find information and collect data that is gonna help us solve the problem and make things better at the other end. So um, we were very intentional on, um, you know, trying to help their uh, confidence in their research ability um, through the very start of the onboarding experience. Additionally, we were um, very intentional about how this job would assist with future employment, regardless of their major. So um, from the 2016 class, uh, some of the students that graduated um, were able to go into positions um, where they were directly able to talk about the work that they were doing here and um, bring it to their job interviews, you know, and that's just kind of highlights the importance, not just of research and assessment um, on campus, but also um, student employment, how important student employment is, and that students are so much more uh, capable than just sitting at a front desk answering phones and answering, um, you know, emails, like they are able and capable of doing some high end work. 
So when we're doing our training, the biggest lesson that I learned from this, um, you know, from these two experiences was about learning from other institutions. So um, the first time that uh, we started, the, when we started this program, um, we actually saw um, Kristen speaking at the Student Affairs uh, Research and Assessment Conference at Ohio State University. Um, and Kristen really um, discussed some of the great work that there was going on at UCLA and shared a lot of resources um, shared a lot of resources on how to um, engage in this process a little bit more. Another institution that we looked at that had a lot of great resources was North Carolina A&T. Um, so their Provost Scholars um, is a similar project that looks a lot at the research side, research assessment um, of the institution. So I'd also recommend that you look up um, North Carolina A&T Provost Scholars as another potential um, venue to consider. During the training, um, we use more of a curricular approach. And by curricular approach, what I mean by that is we actually assigned readings and videos, readings and training videos. So um, with the readings, um, we would look through, uh, you know, some of the information that we had, you know, from our own graduate programs um, and look at some of the uh, curriculum that we had in the undergraduate programs, but um, trying to pull articles and trying to pull um, examples that students would be able to uh, read easily and try to get some of that information from. And we were very transparent in that um, we told them that when you are doing your readings, that counts as work. Reading is work. You know, reading is part of research. So you should be doing that at, at, at work, you know, just to try to make sure that we are respectful of their time and respectful of their money. Um, another great uh, training resource that we found um, was Ohio State Center for Study of Student Life. Um, so if your students are conducting focus groups, they have some of the best um, resources available. Their YouTube videos, uh, they got about like five or six of them that talk about how to engage, um, how to engage in focus groups, particularly in the student affairs realm, which we highly recommend. Uh, we used an apprenticeship model for our training. Um, so with the, and Kristen talked about this as well, about how um, your workload won't necessarily decrease by engaging, by having students in this um, role. So um, they will need a lot of guidance. And um, we particularly at the very beginning, uh, Jessica Turles and I really focused on um, setting them up for with mock interviews and mock focus groups and lots of examples. Um, so it was important that we didn't just tell them how to go about do it. We actually had a lot of practice rounds with them. Um, so for our focus group training, what we did is we would assign um, each, each, per, each participant a different role. For example, we'd have the person that won't stop talking. We would have the person that would give one word answers. We'd have the person that would um, pull out and talk, you know, and start texting on their phone. So we wanted our students to be as prepared as possible for when they're going through and starting to conduct their focus groups. Um, and finally, during the training, um, it was getting okay with the ambiguity and letting students know that um, we could have all of the best training in the world, but no matter what, when we go into the actual data collection phase, if you're doing it qualitatively, um, there's no way that you could prepare for everything that may happen. You know, so um, it was funny when our students were going out and collecting their first round of focus group data, they talked about like, oh, well, we showed up to the room and there were no chairs, you know, or um, just kind of how, you know, like those little aspects that uh, come up that, you know, we let students know like, hey, it happens, but how do we keep on moving forward? So um, on the next slide, we're going to talk more about um, the importance of some of our uh, institutional partners. So um, we really, you know, this is an odd word to use, but um, I think that we created this roadshow to a certain degree with our undergraduate students. Um, so by that, I mean, is that we would take them around campus and introduce them to students, introduce them to people in different departments and different areas, um, and really just kind of talk up the work that they are going to do. Um, because it's, um, you know, students don't necessarily understand at first how much research and assessment matters at a university, you know, at a college or university. So um, anytime we're walking around campus, we utilize that as an opportunity to kind of share more about them and their experiences and how it's going to impact the university. We also partnered with um, some direct connections um, in Division of Student Affairs, uh, particularly at uh, Governor State University. Um, for example, we set up opportunities to, for our students to meet with uh, career services. 
to um, further emphasize how they could utilize their research, um, how they could utilize this experience in helping them secure employment. So it's um, a matter of talking about uh, transferable skills. Um, we were able to um, find opportunities for them to apply for student travel funds um, because we were a grant um, in the state of Illinois. We didn't have funding for about three years from the state um, because legislature blocks. Um, so um, any type of, you know, traveling type of opportunities that we could get, we had to look for external funding. Um, so it was a matter of partnering with student affairs to have them apply for it. Um, we would have them participate in faculty development day. Um, and at the Bowling, Bowling Green State University, the student learning analysts presented at the um, teaching and learning fair, uh, which is presented by the um, faculty development group on campus. Um, and that's when faculty were coming up afterwards to learn more about what it is that they do and how, um, you know, like there were people that were, you know, kind of poaching them like, oh, how could we get you to do work for our division as well? So um, that was great to see. And finally, Research Day was another opportunity to um, have that experience um, for students to have it on their resume or CV um, as they're going on into the job market, because many of them are not going into higher education student affairs. So um, we would have to talk about what it is that we could do to make sure that um, these experiences would help them in the future. Um, finally, um, we really focused on the student delivery of messages. Um, so with institutional part, one area that I would recommend that you uh, focus on is practicing how students deliver their presentations as a way that students learn how to um, apply, students learn how to give constructive feedback, you know, and also utilize um, some of the data to guide their, to guide their findings. And then if they have anecdotal information, they could also add that. Um, you know, when appropriate, but it really was important that we worked with our students to understand the importance of letting the research, um, letting the research, letting our findings guide the message that we're going to get across to campus. Um, so this was an interesting challenge at times um, because um, it were on the advisor side, on the faculty advisor side, you know, um, you know, staff advisor side, it was very much, I hear you, and how can we make sure that um, this message is coming across in a way that um, is going to politically um, politically deliver the message so that some so that there's an action item that could happen because of it. So our institutional partners were um, key for this um, and making sure that students were put in positions so that they could really be heard in front of the institutional partners. Yeah, so, and now I think we are going to transition to Jessica um, to learn more about, um, you know, some engaging the overarching themes of engaging students in assessment. Thanks, Matt. So we've heard a lot of great examples here, and I'll bring up some of the questions that have been brought up so far. Um, but we've heard some great best practices of how to engage students in assessment. And the focus here has been on engaging undergraduate students in assessment, because we know there's great work that we have with grad students working in assessment pieces, but you don't want to overlook the great benefits um, and talents that your undergraduate students have. Um, can give you just some, some examples, and there were some um, pieces. Um, Diane had a question about um, how to engage students perhaps with a more um, creative sort of major sort of piece, and Matt had, and Kristen had both touched upon that, that we look for students from all majors. One example, um, that's kind of a benefit of getting students from all different majors is at Bowling Green State University, when we first started this, we would have them do an assessment project and then the deliverables we wanted was for them to create an assessment report and then also an executive summary that they would be able to share to various constituents. Um, we had a visual communications technology student who also had a great idea to say, you know, can we also display this information visually perhaps through an infographic? And so she designed um, an infographic for her project and assisted another student who was working on another project creating the infographic. And now we have that as a standard process. And you're able to see that with um, the link that I've shared through the, through the comment sort of piece. Um, other sort of kind of best practices, um, Elizabeth in the comments have mentioned that you know, some of these assessment pieces, we've been talking about larger scale sort of projects, but it can also start smaller scale. So Elizabeth has mentioned about involving students and piloting instruments. So let's say there's a particular instrument that you want to use with students 
instead of just having a group of student affairs or other sort of staff or faculty members reviewing it, giving those pieces to the students and making sure that it's student-centered language and that they actually it's actually measuring what you want it to measure. So that's a great sort of piece. Um, we've also added in the, the comments piece where some folks have asked about sort of what criteria. Matt has touched upon that during his conversation and we've added in Kristen's um, criteria. The key piece is the kind of underlying theme that we're finding is that it's not that you're looking for students that already have this experience. You're looking for students that have kind of that creative um, and then also um, drive to learn and that inquisitive sort of nature. And that's what's really gonna be helpful. It also is quite helpful if they can work well independently and also on a team, because that's a lot of the work that they're going to be doing. I know when Matt and I first implemented this at BGSU, we thought, well, this is either gonna work really well or it's gonna completely blow up. But in fact, as Matt had mentioned, so we made sure that we paid them for that, but we had to remind them because they would go and work outside of their work hours just because they were so excited about the project. And as Kristen mentioned, um, if there's a possibility of paying the students to do this, I think they take more ownership of it as opposed to um, what we've seen with, with classes and other sort of pieces. So we've talked about some best practices. We've talked about strategies. There's overwhelming benefits um, for, for this for both the students and for the office and the institution at large. Um, there's a variety of sort of plans and considerations when doing this. It's, as Kristen had mentioned, it's not going to ease up your workload, it's just going to redistribute it, but it's also going to be able to give you some great information and insight that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And what we've also found is that having students design the questions to talk to other students about a key um, learning topic You'll get information from those students because they're talking to their peers that you would have never been able to if you were conducting the focus groups, interviews, or surveys. Um, another example, um, Matt had mentioned that, so he had received funding through grants and then used that um, to, to pay students. Um, as Matt had mentioned, we had our students present at um, a, a teaching and learning fair and summit and then we had faculty come up to us afterwards and saying, oh, you now have students trained in this, here have them go forth and do our projects, where we were really intentional about having those students help co-develop some of the questions. And so there was a quantitative literacy grant on campus that they had funds to do um, and gather some information. So the student learning analysts worked with that faculty member to design the questions to facilitate the focus groups, analyze the data, and then presented those findings back to the, that grant committee and that worked out quite well. Um, we have a few minutes, I'm looking to see if there's any other sort of questions, um, if you wanna just type those into kind of the, the comment piece. But in the, the last kind of minutes that we have, if um, Kristen and Matt or Renee have any sort of pieces that they wanna add, I wanna make sure to give them a chance. Thanks, Jessica. I mean, I will just say, like, um, the for me, the value of doing this is the engagement with the students. At, at bottom line, like that that um, you know, particularly in a role like mine, where our our day to day is generally not um, interfacing with students. Um, I you know, I went into student affairs because I care about making a difference in the lives of students, and so for me, the um, uh, it's really energizing to be able to work with the students and, and um, see them develop and hear what they're thinking about and talking about. And so um, I can't um, really sell that piece of it enough just in terms of, um, you know, the enthusiasm that they bring to this that sometimes I think as we do our jobs for longer and longer periods of time, maybe we have more difficulty finding that enthusiasm. And, and I think um, sometimes that engagement with students can really reinvigorate um, what we're doing. So yeah, um, I've really loved the, the work that I've been able to do with students, so. Yeah, I mean, this is probably, you know, I second what Kristen says as far as like this kind of being one of the more um, rewarding experiences of working, um, you know, with research and assessment. So. Um, when you're working with, you know, primarily like advising like capstones and, um, you know, master's thesis projects, you know, um, 
you know, you're in the driver's seat, you know, you're in the car with the, you know, with the researchers and they're, you know, kind of taking you where you need to go. You're going to provide that constructive feedback. Um, but this is a lot different than that. Um, I mean, the students are really, um, you know, they're in the front seat, they're in the entire car. You know, you're just in there to make sure that they're not hitting too many road bumps, you know, and that um, everything is, um, you know, following institutional policies and stuff. And then the, once it's finished, watching the students present their work, you know, it's just, um, you know, it was the best experience at Ohio State, you know, when the students were talking about um, how they actually feel, you know, they were saying that, like, we feel like we belong here, you know, and that, um, you know, we don't just have stories, like, you know, what we did is actually present data. You know, that was one of the coolest things that I've, um, you know, experienced um, so far working with undergraduates. And then there, uh, thanks Elizabeth for sharing. So at a recent NASPA conference, she saw um, a presentation from the University of Albany on their student affairs assessment planning office involving an undergraduate internship office. At the um, SARC conference, the student affairs assessment research conference at OSU, um, Bradley University also has um, assessment scholars. So these are undergraduate students that um, generate research and form um, and then kind of help inform campus decisions. So there's a lot of lot of great work out there, um, and then we'll keep gathering those and, and share those different sort of pieces. Um, in the, the moment that we have left, just want to let you know that um, we have a great um, upcoming structured conversation coming up, exploring data analysis, a step-by-step -step introduction to basic descriptive data analysis using Excel. Um, it's going to be on Tuesday, August 13th. You can see the various times, and then the facilitator, um, you're, that will be posted on the student affairs assessment uh, leaders website soon. And so you'll be able to register for that just like you registered for this. This um, structured conversation will also be emailed out to everyone so you have access to that. And we thank you for participating and we hope you have a great rest of your day.